Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Zena Suisa, President of Residence Executive and Team Coaching. I am so delighted to say I have a wonderful um, a person that's going to be uh, with me today for a couple of minutes or whatever time we come up with and answer some uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Jane Dutton. And first, Dr. Jane, if I may, I'd like to talk a little bit about you. Okay, that's okay. great. I'm going to talk. Thank you. So Dr. Jane Dutton's research and expertise lies at the intersection of strategy, management, and organizations, and psychology. She lives my life. I love that. Jane has a, uh, has a joint appointment between the management and organizations department at the Ross Business School and Department of Psychology at University of Michigan, a great university. Jane's research is multivariate. Her research has explored compassion in organizations, resilience in organizations, energy in organizations, as well as many other areas. She's one of the founders of the Center for Positive Organizational Scholarship, now known as the Center for Positive Organizations. You can see the book just right behind me, which is on Positive Organizational Scholarship. She's published over 100 articles and book chapters, edited 13 books, written two books for managers called Energize Your Workplace, How to Build and Sustain High Quality Connections at Work. And the book we're gonna be talking about today is Awakening Compassion at Work, which was written with Monica Warline. Right? Warline. Um, she has been a recipient of many, many awards. Best Paper of the Year, Distinguished Scholar Award, Rece Researcher of the Year, Distinguished University Professor. You've done amazing, amazing work, as I said, just as before we started talking. Um, I know, and I'm gonna give something away. When I first met you, you talked about gardening as a metaphor. And I'd love for you to share a story with us, maybe about the metaphor and gardening, somewhere along the, if you, you choose to do it now, because that's an amazing, I never thought of gardening as a metaphor, but you're obviously very right brain, left brain. You use the creativity, you know? So amazing. Yeah, well, I, I love the, as, as I mentioned when we were initially talking, yeah. um, I, I'm an organizational researcher and I really am so interested in what, what makes people grow at work and flourish at work. And so the metaphor of gardens allows me to talk a lot about soil. And I'm particularly interested in how everyday practices and policies and organizations cultivate a soil mm -hmm. in which people can either flourish or languish. And so the focus on compassion, which I know is something we want to talk about today, has, is one of the ways to think about how um, an organization that is um, competent in compassion actually is tilling the soil in which people can um, are more likely to flourish and grow. So like my mom said, get out there and till soil and get into the earth and, and you create a metaphor, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, so I, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Okay. First of all, the book is profound for me. It is. As I read through it, what touched me was you're, you're dealing with suffering and bringing it to compassion. And we're missing a lot of that. I've worked, I've taught, I've been a psychologist. We're missing a lot of that. What drew you to that area of compassion? Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, answer that question from two perspectives. One is more the research focus, and then the other is a more personal story. So I'll start with the research. Um, I mean, as you suggest, I felt I've been an organizational researcher for close to 40 years, and i I believe that so much of the human experience, in particular the pain and suffering of human experience, wasn't being represented in how we talk about work organizations. So compassion became a way to bring back the human humanity kind of sort of into the thinking about work organizations. And it, it actually helps us to look at a whole other um, set of ways that we can have a positive influence on organizations by not just reducing suffering, which is never reducible, there's always going to be human yeah. suffering, but how can we meet that suffering, again, with practices, policies, human connections in organizations that actually allows people to, um, to work with and, and hopefully heal from suffering. So that's sort of the more research. It was just sort of filling, filling a gap at some level. And it was a way to put into sharp relief certain types of leadership skills 
that um, I think were really being ignored but are really important. On the personal side, um, many years ago now, about 25 years ago, um, we had a, like a trauma happen in our family and I, as you mentioned, had a joint appointment in two departments. And so mm -hmm. there was, again, a definitely a pain, painful experience for my husband and I. He's on the faculty as well. And what we noticed was both areas, both departments, had really good people in them. So this was not an issue of good people. Yeah. But one of the areas was much more effective in helping us heal from that trauma than the other. And it was a mystery. It was a puzzle. Like, what was it about the soil? <laughs> Let's go back to that metaphor. Yeah. In one place that made it feel, made us feel very differently and... I think helped us to be much more resilient and uh, bounce back from that very personal experience of suffering. So um, I think part of the motivation that's really sustained, not just me, but as you mentioned, this book was written with Monica Warline. Um, and I've been part of an, a whole community of researchers um, who have been interested in compassion. And Monica in particular um, is just been somebody who's, really um, made me much more courageous mm. about about thinking about um, human compassion. I would not have been able to do this work without her. She's just an extraordinary writer and thinker, but also just someone who lives that humanity every day. <laughs> well, I give, I give you, that's amazing, the stories, uh, but it's, you're very much part of that. I do believe that. I've heard you speak and uh, amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's amazing. So as far as the book is concerned, you have an area that you propose six areas of strategic advantage, which have repercussions on the workplace. And I'd like to read off the six areas. So it's innovation, service quality, collaboration, retaining talented people, employee engagement, and adaptability to change. I've chosen one. And if you can relate adaptability to change, to compassion. Yeah, so um, I will do that. I just want to say that um, in our first version of this book, we didn't really make the business case as oh. much for why, why we should care about compassion. So the identification of those six areas was really our answer back to the publishers about why we should, why we should care about compassion. And actually, when we worked on this, we got even more excited about mm -hmm. um, the importance of this perspective. But let me answer your question about why is compassion oh. important for, yeah. um, for understanding or increasing an organization's um, adaptability to change. Right. And I don't need to tell you that, uh, you know, in all organizations now, you, there's no organization that's doing anything in the world that is not under pressure to change. It's just constant. Yeah. And change creates pain, um, even if it's expected change or understood change. But so much change that's happening in organizations is unexpected and not understood. So one of the reasons compassion is so important is that change um, naturally uh, creates pain and suffering. And so the question is, how can, and pain and suffering is information, I should say that, so that um, in thinking about an organization becoming more effective, they're more adaptable to change, you need good information about how current conditions have been altered. And suffering and pain actually can be really important windows into the types of human experiences that need to be addressed right. in the change process. Right. So that's one reason why um, compassion is important is because it writes in uh, suffering and pain as actually um, information or input into um, into designing more effective change processes but another reason why why compassion is an important lens for improving adaptation to change is thinking about what is the repertoire or different kinds of ways that an organization can respond to change mm -hmm. and um, compassion sort of highlights the importance of emotional resources as important in helping change be effective change be accomplished 
And so compassion, I think, helps to identify a broader range of solutions right. or um, ways of, um, of coping with the inevitability of change. Um, and it is the kind of um, change solutions that highlights the importance of honoring and working with the emotional responses of individuals to Amazing. change conditions. Amazing. And that brings me to actually a continuation of that. You created a, a big part of your book. It's almost like a prescriptive for areas to deal with when you have to, to awaken compassion in the workplace. So you have to notice, you have to interpret, you have to feel, am I on the right track? Right. <laughs> you have to act. I know because I loved it so much. I started like creating acronyms and learning it and, and telling everybody about it because it's amazing. It really is. Could you walk us through that a little bit briefly? Because I think people need to read the book. So it's, you know what? Briefly. <laughs> well, I'll just, um, again, just preview and answer, and, well, I'll answer your question, but I'll just say that um, in contrast to psychologists, when they think about compassion, who often define compassion as an emotion, so it's something that people feel, the way we've approached compassion is to think of it more as a process, yes. and it's a process that has these identifiable um, phases or elements, um, and those are the things that the, the four parts that you're talking about. And so, again, from a practical perspective, if we think about a compassion as a process and ask the question, um, you know, how can we design organizations where each of these elements in the compassion process is, is um, designed to make the compassion more competent? Um, I think it helps, again, kind of like I suggested before, to uh, us to identify a broader solution set or a range of options that we could do, we could take as leaders or as anybody in an organization to lift up um, again the human um, the effectiveness of the human response to suffering mm -hmm. so let's start with noticing so yeah. noticing is as, as the name implies is really about how can um, a, a team or an organization be designed so that so that suffering even registers <laughs> with other people and um, noticing, if, we don't, if you don't notice suffering, the whole compassion process um, breaks down. I mean, there is no compassion without noticing suffering. And so um, there are a variety of, of things that could be, can be done to increase an organization's um, or people within an organization's sensitivity to pain um, and to suffering. One is one sort of um, simple idea is is literally about space. It's a, it's about time. It's about presence. About an individual's or an organization's um, ca capacity to be present to the current conditions of humans. So you could ask something simple like, you know, how are meetings designed in ways that would allow for the noticing of suffering. Um, and noticing often depends on, on um, being able to, to ask good questions or, the, or inquiry. And so organizations or teams that are effective at compassion are actually often very skilled in the kinds of questions that they ask um, people that allow for people to disclose suffering in terms that are, that are comfortable for them. And so good inquiry around yeah. effective noticing Right. Um, is inquiry that doesn't cross over the line in terms of imposing on people or, or threatening people by wanting to know how people are doing. But it's a kind of gentle inquiry to find out about people's conditions so that they can disclose um, what, what might be painful or um, might be causing suffering in their lives. So that's noticing. noticing yeah. um, and interpreting is, is or, or feeling, let me, they, these, these steps are not necessarily in this sequential order. Every process is yeah. somewhat unique. It always has to start out with noticing. Yeah. Yeah. But whether feeling empathic concern or interpreting someone's suffering comes next in the process, that, that's variable. But let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about um, interpretation. And in order for, um, for uh, a compassion process to unfold, there needs to be, people need to give people um, sort of what we call generous interpretations, mm -hmm. giving people sort of the, 
the benefit of the doubt that in fact um you know this the suffering is real for a person and that a person really could benefit from from um someone taking action um to ha to to address that suffering and so um i'll give you an example again from research that we've done um interpretation or generous interpretations depend a lot on um, shared values in an organization or shared values in a team. And one of the, I'll give you an example, uh, one of the incidences that we studied was um, universities' responses to Hurricane Sandy, yeah. which was a devastating hurricane on the East Coast yeah. um, that, that caused, um, again, variable suffering for students and yeah. staff, faculty who worked in different universities. We, we interviewed people, um, both administrators, leaders, as well as faculty um, in those different universities and found that there were very different um, values expressed in the wake of that hurricane that shaped how people interpreted the suffering of the people in that organization. So in one university, for example, the, there was a sense that um, while the hurricane did some damage to some people, not to others. Students were going to take advantage of this opportunity and um, and try to get out of classes. It was it was a set of values that um, again um, did not. It was not generous. It was it created actually a lot of uncertainty and uh, fear about um, about a students' conditions that mm -hmm. did not call forth a compassionate response. In another university, there was just very generous interpretations right from the beginning when there, there was information search um, being spread about the possible implications of the hurricane. It was always about giving the students the benefit of doubt, mm -hmm. doing whatever it takes to extend care to anybody because mm -hmm. you wouldn't know who was being affected, whose families were being affected. And it was, it, it actually unleashed a whole bunch of resources um, that different people could use in the organization to try to cope with um, the pain and suffering brought about by the hurricane. So the interpretations on the ground um, about, in response to that triggering attempt were fundamentally tied to the kinds of values and shared beliefs that got expressed in the wake of, that, of the hurricane that were tied to, again, fundamental values and, and beliefs of those organizations. So mm -hmm. interpretation is a really important part of the, of the compassion process, and it's very much affected by what are the uh, values and beliefs in the organization. Yeah, good. The, the third phase or third, third part of the compassion process is about feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's um, in order for... Um, the, the sort of the very heartfelt response of compassion from one individual to another to really happen, it has, has to be felt in some way. Mm -hmm. And the research would suggest that the feeling is, that is, is most important is, this, what, is what is called empathic concern, yes. which is I, I feel in some ways the, the suffering of the other and I am that concern or that feeling is associated with a motivation to act, to help in mm. some kind of way. Mm. And again, organizations or teams can really vary in terms of how much that, um, that, that feeling of empathic concern is unleashed or smothered <laughs> in the face of human pain. So organizations that are good at um, where people are, know each other and they are good at taking the perspective of, of another person are organizations in which the empathic concern runs more freely and more um, fully yeah. and is associated with, again, a higher level of compassion. And the final stage of the, of the compassion process is what we call compassionate responding or compassionate action. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know there's so many different ways that people can respond to the pain of another there can be small actions like um you know a hug 
or just listening, being present to another person. Or there are much uh, larger, <laughs> bigger scale kind of actions where um, you know people are maybe given um, time off or they're given um, all kinds of other kinds of monetary or other material resources that allow people um, to cope with the suffering that they're um, experiencing. So um, again, the, in understanding and looking at um, variability across organizations in the, their effectiveness or confidence and compassion, we can look at, again, what are the, what are the diversity of different kinds of actions that, um, that unfold in the wake of, of suffering and how effective are those actions and even in, in helping to alleviate the suffering. And, and Jane, can I say, it's at every level. It's not just the, the hierarchy of the top of the pyramid that has to do the, the, that has to deal with this compassion and help people with compassion. I work in a school that went through a shooting. 21 people were shot. Oh. It's amazing how the school changed because of that. Because we saw the suffering. One person died. Another one, unfortunately, has a bullet in his brain to this day. But you oh. can see the compassion and the day the kids came back, we were at the door to greet them and hug them. Teachers didn't hug students that much, you know. All of a sudden, we became the tightest circle of teachers and students ever, ever. And we're still in contact with these students because we have that value base of honoring and valuing t students. So what you're saying, I think we lived. Yeah. Well, that's a whole other way of thinking about the the impact of compassion is how um, competent or not an organization is in the wake of, of suffering. And you're talking about with a shooting, something that's yeah. really, um, yeah. really deep, yeah. deep, horrifying. Yes. If an organization, it sounds like your organization responded well to that. And that increased an organization's capability um, and uh, it, probably in lots of other for lots of other kinds of actions and increases people's commitment and engagement yeah. and loyalty to the organization. But similarly, we've studied organizations where the response to human suffering was poor and that actually undercut all kinds of subsequent capabilities and assets that an organization had. So, so, so um, effective responding to these kind, these kinds of suffering has often long-term impacts yes. on the people, but also the capability of an organization. Right, you have it, you have something, and I think it's it it leads from from the area of noticing, interpreting, feeling, and acting. You have what's called compassion confidence. I like the phrase compassion confidence. Yeah. How, how can uh, how can an organization be more? How can they design for compassion? confidence maybe one or two ways yeah so um i think um one is to think about what can you do with respect to individuals or leaders or people in the in an organization how can you equip them to be more competent in in compassion that means you know noticing appropriately interpreting um you know and feeling empathic concern and acting um, in ways that will alleviate the suffering. So you can um, help to coach and train leaders about um, about list of effective listening, about being um, about being present, about letting people's humanity be on display, mm -hmm. uh, about modeling cultural values. I mean, so there's lots of things that you can do and that organizations are doing to um, to train people um, and to equip them to be more effective or competent um, in the face of suffering. But organizations can also do things that are more about at the, at the collective level. And so um, organizations can implement routines and practices that cultivate a capacity for compassion competence. So an example would be um, you know, what do you, what kind, what are the routines or, or practices that are, that are used actually in selecting um, new employees? And one of the organizations we've studied is LinkedIn and how they actually um, 
um, use the selection interviews as a way to um, determine whether people value compassion mm -hmm. as, um, as, as something important to them. And so they, they don't worry just about training people. They actually try to screen whether or not people get in the door who are oriented with a more, um, a more compassion um, set of values, more compassion related set of values. So I think that compassion competence and what we try to talk about in the book is partly related to the people, but it's also per very much related to the practices and routines um, that again till the soil till the <laughs> is soil. organization that make it more or less likely to be competent for compassion and again as somebody who's you know been teaching students you know for 35 years I I, I try so hard to to um, equip students with lenses for interpreting whether or not an organization has good soil or not and I often ar argue make argue that you know it really their life depends on it and because what's going to happen to them the soil that they're growing in you know in their 20s and 30s is going to affect their health and well-being you know 20 years down the line that it is serious business to find an organization with good soil and just like a um a good body has a, a healthy body has a healing capacity because we all get wounded Yes. A healthy organization is one that, you know, people who bring suffering in the door or an organization that creates suffering, it's one that heals well. And that is one that has a high compassion capability or competence. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw, I, I learned so much from you because we're talking about values. We're talking about suffering and organizations being responsible because they're responsible to help. Like you as a teacher, it tried to instill that in students so that later on in life, because students are quite young at that time, they don't really get it all the time, you know? But you're trying to instill something in them so that it will nurture them towards and going in a direction where they will have compassion and good values and beliefs, etc. Well, and I'll just add that it's not just about what we might do as as parents or as teachers, but I think a lot about, you know, what did my university do in terms of making it easier or more difficult for me to be a compassionate teacher? Yes. Because students, just like employees, are coming in to the classroom with suffering. I mean, it's in just inevitable. And sometimes our, actually our classrooms create suffering. Yes. You know, how, how well trained or equipped are we to act on that deeply human response towards compassion? How well equipped are we or how much is the, our universities or, or schools actually hindering our capacity to show up as compassionate teachers? Exactly. So, yeah, there's a, it, this, studying this has just brought up so many questions for me. Um, about how we could improve all of our organizations, um, you know, if we designed more with an eye towards compassion. But you have designed, the, the end of the book has blueprints. I mean, I, I fell in love with the blueprints. So this, this is such a great idea. Such a great yeah. idea. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I think, again, once people, it's partly just a mindset. Mm -hmm. Once people become aware of that there are things we can do systematically mm -hmm. um, to increase the probability that um, that the the organization just like a uh, you know a body would be have healthy responses to human suffering once you start ha taking on that mindset again it, in this in this time of you know um, I think, a, you know, a lot of uh, fear and uncertainty about our world. Yes. I feel like um, at least this gives me hope. It gives me grounded hope and the possibility that all organizations could participate in, um, in healing suffering um, and, and, you know, make the world better. I know that sounds kind of overly optimistic, but I feel like I need that optimism now. Yeah. I totally agree because the world is somewhat chaotic. It is. It is. I don't like saying that. 
So then I got stuck. I have to tell you, I got stuck in one thing. And I went down to my husband, which I, I don't often ask, but I said, what is leading with compassion and what is leading for compassion? Give me an example. <laughs> well, again, this is kind of this two, um, the, the two different eyes you can use in, in sort of thinking about lifting up a, an organization's ca um, compassion capability. One is trying to equip leaders to lead um, with compassion. That's more focusing on them as individuals. What can they do um, as individuals to model compassion in interaction with other people? Okay. Um, and in the book, we go through, I think, some pretty vivid examples yeah. of people that we have run into in organizations who modeled that beautifully. Because people look up to leaders and, and follow, you know, follow what they do. So there's all kinds of ways that organizations can um, enhance compassion capability by leading themselves um, in a more compassionate way. Um, but the leading for compassion is, again, trying to urge people to think about how do you design systems in which compassion is more, is more likely. And that's where the blueprints that you referred to earlier, I think, yes. help up to expand people's sense of possible ways that they can design rewards, selection processes, right. reward processes, meeting processes, right. all these routine things that we do in organizations. If we could design those where, it, again, it, from a probabilistic point of view, it makes it more likely this, this deeply human healing force, which sometimes resides in individuals, but sometimes resides in groups of individuals, yeah. could be on. It's wonderful. So I have to tell you what I really, and I, I should have said in the beginning, what I loved about the book is not only it's research-based, evidence-based, but it's applicable. So you've given a lot of case studies. And I, I find myself drawn into that, you know, so people understand it's not just theory, theory, theory. All of a sudden, we've got a case, an actual case where you can understand what it is the theory is trying to say. So to me, that was uh, amazing. And the blueprints, absolutely. You have an amazing book. You really, oh, you. yes, because I read a lot. You can see behind me, I read a lot. So I thought with your permission, I would like to read a small passage from the epilogue, which, which struck me. It really okay, did. Okay, yeah, no, I'd love that. You okay with that? Okay, so there's, I found a lot of sentences, but I found this particular passage, which was so, for me, profound. When we regard the quiet power of compassion as a call to a whole new way of being, we change our work in ways that are both tiny and vast. We pick up in, on small clues when something is amiss. We ask a delicate question with sensitivity. We are willing to close the door, turn off the phone, and create safe space for emotions to emerge. We reject cultures of brutality. We embrace goals of stewardship. We no longer shrink from compassion as part of our work roles, whether we clean the floors or fly the planes or lead the troop. troops. Sorry, The life-saving, life-giving power of compassion to elevate people and organization makes it everyone's job. That wrapped it up for me. <laughs> Thank I, you. I yeah, love I love that. I just love I'll that. Give Monica credit for composing yeah. that sentence. If you look through the book, I've written a lot of things. There was one more thing that you put from, I, I met the Dalai Lama because I was privileged to go listen to the Bell Center to the Dalai Lama and I loved him. The Dalai Lama said, love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. Yeah. That, that's another, so there's a lot of very profound statements that really hits to the core. It really yeah. does, you know. And I believe that younger people should be reading. I know you're teaching at a university, but I believe this should really be read by even younger people. Yeah. Well, there, you know, there's all kinds of efforts um, in schools um, for reducing bullying at work and those kinds of uncivil yeah. interpersonal behaviors in young schools and part of the way that that um, they are addressing that is actually increasing kids capacity to be compassionate to be kind to notice the suffering of their of their pals and their friends and other people's at school so I am hopeful I am that, too. Um, again 
that we can lift up the overall capacity for compassion. Yeah. Um, but if we start with younger people, that's even better. <laughs> like this gratitude, like when I asked my grandchildren, could you tell me three things that you, that you feel grateful for? And they said, again, I said, yes, I can. Just share <laughs> that. And they got used to it. It's like, this is natural for them. And that's what we have to create. It becomes part of their repertoire. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so thank, thank you, thank you yeah. for the opportunity to share so, this. I really appreciate it. <laughs> been wonderful and again i love the university of michigan ross business school and i'd like i'd like to be working with you because i love this area of the like i told you before the overlap of business and psychology and i i enter both arenas so it's been it's been wonderful it's been, i can't thank you enough I can't thank, thank you. Me. I look forward to future conversations. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> thank you. I don't want to keep you because I know you're still a, you're a busy lady. You're a busy lady. And you're also tending to gardening. Yes, I and am. To me, I will never forget that. Heifer, this has been quite a few years. And I said, I know she is the woman that loves the metaphor to gardening. That's yeah. wonderful. Keep gardening. Keep on thank gardening. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Thank you.